Thank you for inviting me to give this keynote on this topic, which is really important to me, biomedical engineering for global health. I'm Leandro Pecchia, I'm a professor of biomedical engineering with a double appointment. So I've been in Warwick for many years, but from February, I moved in Italy to University Campus Biomedico while I still keep a part-time position in Warwick. Beyond that, I'm the innovation manager for the IPC unit for COVID-19 in the emergency program of the World Health Organization. And I have a few more international appointments that probably I can explain better on this slide, starting my talk. So this is the global ecosystem of biomedical engineering. We have IAMBES, which is the European Society of Biomedical Engineering, which is part of the IFMB, which is the Global Scientific Society of Biomedical Engineers, which together with IOMP, the Global Scientific Society of Medical Physicists, belong to the IOPES, the International Union for Physical and Engineering Science in Medicine. This is the ecosystem of scientific societies, but those are also NGOs in official relation with United Nations. That's why I put on the top of these slides the different agencies of United Nations, and particularly relevant to us, obviously, given our mission, we are NGOs in official relation with the World Health Organization and IOPESM is part of the International Science Council, which is the uh, part, which is an organ of UNESCO, which is the interface among UNESCO and uh, sciences in general, unions of uh, uh, scientists. And uh, this is the perspective that I will adopt while giving this brief talk. In this ecosystem, I have a few positions, in particular, I'm the president of the European Society of Biomedical Engineering. But let's go uh, brief introduction about my work. My main expertise lies in application of artificial intelligence for health and well-being. And in the past few years, I have been uh, financing this research with uh, several research projects. So if you like to come visiting our lab in Warwick, you will find uh, uh, those kind of activities. So rocket engineering plus whatever sensor to measure any sort of biomedical signal in any environment, plus whatever equipment you may need to test medical devices. Most important with those projects, uh, I managed to create a lab in Warwick, which is now directed by uh, Davide Piaggio since I moved in Rome. And since August, I am building this new lab in Rome. But the main point of this slide is this one. This is a multidisciplinary lab. So, lab. so you see Alessia, she's a bioethicist. Uh, we are all biomedical engineers, most of us, but uh, Salman is a computer scientist and Carlo Federici is an health economist, Tim is a mathematician, Katie Stuck is a biologist. And this is really important because we face, especially in relation to global health, complex challenges. And there is only one way to face global challenges, which is, with the multidisciplinary approach. So we are a multidisciplinary team. And that's the reason why I put these slides because that's the only way to face complex problems. What do we do in our lab? Well, several things, but for this particular talk, our main goal is to apply biomedical engineering in order to facilitate the achievement of the global sustainable goal number three. We focus mainly in Africa where so far we have got 10 health uh, field studies in 24 months. We had to stop due to COVID, but we are restarting now in different sub-Saharan African countries. And what we do in Africa? Well, let's start from this point. As biomedical engineers and scientists, we know exactly what happens between medical devices and people. And by people, I mean mainly patients, but then also healthcare professionals, even during an accident. What we know much less is how medical devices interact with the environment in which you use that. And why this is the case? Because when we design medical device, we mainly think to European standards, North American standards, Japan standards. And that's because those three macro regions, they absorb the 80% of the global market of medical device. But when you move a medical device in a context such as the one that you may find in Sub-Saharan Africa, now you have to consider this environment is working somewhere else, not in the same environment for which it has been designed for. And in fact, the main challenges that we face in Africa are those three. Hospital standards are different than the one we have in the UK. There is a chronic lack of specialized staff. You think you're talking with an anesthesiologist, but 
probably is just a technician trained to use an anesthetic machine. And there is a chronic lack of a good supply chain. So supply chain is a big issue. In the UK, we are used to use Amazon for whatever, and in 24 hours, we can get the spain part. In Africa, this is a little bit more complicated, and people don't really cope well with that. I still see a lot of, for instance, donation, and then people do not consider that this spare part or maintenance components are not available in that country. So we still have this kind of problem. And we look at the whole life cycle of medical devices, design, regulation, management, assessment, and more and more environmental impact, because this is really important. Now, let me give you an exemplar of our programmatic work focusing on challenge number one. First step is to really understand and document hospital standards in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is a work we did in 2014. Uh, where we started analyzing plants in different hospitals, so visual inspection of electric plants, and then we started doing some measures, very rudimental the first time, we were not well equipped, but look at this number. So we were measuring 100 volts on the ground of this medical device, and that's an issue because there should be no more than a few volts on the ground. And the problem here was that this plug, as you can see, this is a UK typical plug, and in the wall it was a Schuko, so the German looking like a, a plug. And uh, this adapter contained no plug for the ground. And now this medical device, which was supposed to be grounded, is suddenly floated. So this is a big issue. Here you see other numbers which are much above the required standard for other reason and just because as the picture you can see above the plant is not exactly done as we do in the uk this is another important picture this was an x-ray unit and this was the best place to make a phone call and this means that this was not shielded and uh, now you can imagine that all the ionizing radiation arriving on the screen are probably reaching also the guy which is behind this wall. And so our intervention here was to relocate this office and put the store there while they were trying to shield the room. And then we equipped ourselves with the dedicated clinical engineering equipment for testing everything from electric safety to quality of air and incubator, electrobistry and other stuff. And we went back again in a couple of countries and with my PhD student David, we did several measurements. And for instance, here you see the quality of current on the main in different, well, this is one particular Sargic theater, and I don't want to enter in detail, but 99% of measures were out of the range, which could well explain why up to 70% of medical devices in some sub Saharan Africa uh, rural areas are reported to be broken or not working correctly. So the quality of the power supply is a huge problem. But this is just an example, probably the same may apply to water, to hygienic condition. And the reason why we are not really prepared to face that is because whenever you think about an hospital in, in the UK, in Europe, in North America and in Japan, you know that there are international standards on which a national law will give or a, a, a standardizing body will give minimum requirements, accreditation body. And those minimum requirements will include the organizational aspect of the hospital, technological dimension and infrastructural dimension. And whatever you know about the medical device, actually it lies on those three pillars. And that's important because now if I am in an environment in which those international standards are not met and those minimum requirements are not well defined by law, and the organization is changing. So now you don't have enough specialized doctor and the infrastructure is not the same and uh, you don't have an equipotential node, which is probably the case in the surgery theater, then whatever you know about medical device is not anymore uh, assumed as granted. Probably they are not anymore as safe and effective as you think they are in our hospitals in the UK. And that's a big issue. So we started from there, but then, listening to my good friend Ben Seng, he every time requests us to use uh, evidence-based approach for clinical engineering. So we started working on how to report the real situation of hospitals and medical devices and clinical engineering services in hospitals in Africa. So this is an exemplar of paper where, you know, 
many reports they just bring spot situations such as the picture you see on this part of the screen. But the point is that on the left, now you have to start making this a little bit more systematic. So we are looking on how our friends from the medical and clinical domain they do when they do a randomized control trial. And we try to be as systematic as they are also, we are reporting information on medical devices, medical settings, so the domain of clinical, eventually hospital engineering. And then the second challenge I mentioned is the chronic shortage of specialized professionals, healthcare professionals, but I must say also biomedical engineers. And this is just an example. This is the work of one of my PhD students, uh, Katie Stoke. So together using artificial intelligence, we developed a model uh, uh, through which it is possible to identify pneumonia versus other pulmonary conditions such as bronchitis as in this case. And there was a previous work with my friend Almir from Bosnia about uh, uh, asthma. So with AI and just basing on symptoms and signs, we have with an accuracy and with sensitivity specificity above 80%, the possibility to understand if a subject is affected by pneumonia and not asthma and not bronchitis. Why this is important? Because for instance, pneumonia uh, can be due to bacteria, to viruses, to fungi. And knowing this in advance means that you can start with the right prophylaxis. Because if you start giving just antibiotic to everyone, then now you are creating antimicrobial resistance, which is a huge drama, not just for Africa. So this is just an example using AI based on symptoms and signs. Obviously, 80% is not 100%. But there are rural areas where you have to walk two days to reach an hospital. So before doing that, probably just using an AI model on a mobile phone, just based on symptoms and signs, it's a very useful and sensible approach. That's another example, uh, pupillary reflex. For instance, this is used in order to detect brain trauma, which is a, a, a dominant cause of mortality, for instance, in Nigeria due to mainly car accidents. And the alternative you have is that if you have a specialized clinician with just a light pen, which is an object which is just $5, you can identify a brain trauma through the way in which the pupillary react to the light. The alternative is to use a digital pupillometer, but now this is again, not designed for Sub-Saharan Africa. So not resistant to dust, uh, heat and humidity that we found in those hospitals. So what we did? Well, we developed an app and used the mobile phone, which by shutting the flash into the eye, emulated the digital pupillometer using the light. So this was a little bit different why the digital pupillometer using infrared. But still, this light is so strong that it's also dominant against the environmental light. And now you can study the reflex of the pupil and therefore try to extract key information, which eventually now with machine learning technique, we can also support the decision and suggest to a clinician that probably there, there is a brain trauma. Again, clinician, because it's my attitude, but probably it's not a clinician because we don't have enough clinicians in Africa. And David, my PhD student and now director of the lab in Warwick, uh, won several prizes on that. This is another exemplar, neuro, but is due to diabetic conditions, which is a huge drama in Africa and in many other lower income countries. So because of uh, diabetic conditions, the nerve can be damaged. And now the patient does not have sensitivity into the foot. A doctor well-trained could understand that there is a risk for eventually developing a wound and then this wound get infected and now you arrive to an amputation, which is a drama in the UK. It's even more a drama in Africa. So how do they do that? Well, they do the vibration perception test. So you see whether there is still perception to vibration, two point discrimination. So you get two needles closer and closer and you see whether the patient understand those are two needles. When they become as a feeling as one needle, this is the minimum resolution of your uh, sense into the foot. And then there are questionnaires. So what we did? Well, questionnaires and up. Uh, 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 discrimination testing. We 3D printed with recyclable plastic uh, this toy, and now we know exactly at which millimeter you have the minimum uh, resolution of your sensitivity and vibration. Well, 
with 3D printed this accessory, which is a mechanical amplifier, and we can get different intensity of vibration by changing the shape of this thing or changing the vibration into the mobile phone if it is a model which allows to do that. And now what are we going next? Well, collecting this information, train an AI model to get this risk assessment done automatically. Not even AI model, because there can be deterministic modeling here. So just implementing in an app what we have already as an if-then-else algorithm given by international guidelines. That's just another example. Uh, and let me move on the third and last challenge, supply chain. This is a huge problem. Here, this is an oxygen concentrator. One of the nurse called us and told us, look, this is not working because when I move it from two to three, it does not double the flow. And when we open it, we saw this level of dust that you probably can see from the image within the device. Why that? Because when you use this in the UK, you assume and you can assume that the surgic theater is completely sterilized and the, the air is completely pure at 99%. But this is not the situation of many environments where I have seen running surgeries in Africa. So what we did in this case, well, 3D printing, uh, and using activated carbon coil, which is recyclable, so you can do this as many times as you like, you can just wash the filter. We've tested the, fit, the, 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 the filter in lab, so against the original one, given the percentage of particles at this dimension, migrants, uh, with the, the, the real filter, you have about a log three, uh, the diminishing of particles. Particles with our filter, you have something in the order of log two. It's not perfect, but it's much better than nothing. And so this is another pragmatic solution that uh, we would recommend to adopt. We are now reviewing the design of this filter to make it more efficient and less resistant to the age. That's another example, intrauterine balloon tamponade. So this is uh, the medical device to overcome the problem of uh, postpartum hemorrhagic events, which is the first cause of mortality for maternal medicine in sub-Saharan Africa. So what we did, 3D printing using uh, recyclable plastic. So we emulated the, the, the cap of a bottle, two liter bottles. We used the tiny plastic tube. That's the one from uh, Coca-Cola drafted, which you can find everywhere in Africa. And we used the condom. And we tested this against the standard of the uh, NHS in terms of maximum leakages and loss of pressure after three or five hours and after the solution meet those requirements. So again, that's just another exemplar. Long way forward, because from the idea in the lab to the real life, you have to pass through what the WHO well defined into the compendium of innovative medical devices for low middle income countries in terms of regulation, assessment, and many other steps. But those are just tiny idea on how we can tackle those three challenges using frugal innovation approach. Concluding, what we have done in Africa is the work that you see here. So field studies, assembling a medical device, uh, inspections in hospital, and working with the local uh, technicians. But then also a lot of training to technicians, to students, to researchers, and to those who educate students in Africa, because that's important. And last but not least, dialogue with institutions. Here we were with the Africa Unites when we spinned up the first working group on biomedical engineers in Africa within the IFMB. Here we were meeting the Ministry of Research in Ethiopia and here is the Ministry of Health in uh, uh, Benin. But most important, bringing African scholars in our institution to tell our policymaker how we can improve our international regulations so that we also uh, avoid having a negative impact on our surrounding countries, in this case, in Africa. A few literature, in case you are interested, you can, I can probably circulate those slides. And there we are. In short term, evidence-based clinical engineering is really needed in Africa to better understand and therefore react. Technology for compensating the shortage of specialized workers, especially in the short and medium term. And then we need to overcome supply chain bottleneck and probably frugal innovation can be a solution in the meantime. Thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take any question after this presentation.